I'm Ryan Johnson. I'm Eric Johnson. We're brothers and founders of Homage. And together we train actors. For some pretty cool roles. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Scarlett Johansson, Ghost in the Shell. Scarlett's character's role as major in this film was a cyborg. A cyborg is a machine, a machine meant to kill. The climax of the movie is one of the final battle scenes where Scarlett is on top of a spider tank and she is trying to open the door with all of her strength and all of her might. And she begins to put so much force into trying to get this door open that she actually rips her arms off her cyborg body. In order to make that look as realistic as possible when we were shooting, we decided that we really wanted to focus on her back, her delts, and her posterior chain, so her glutes and hamstrings. We had eight weeks to prep before principal photography began. Once we began filming, we continued the process. We had six months where we continued training five to six days per week. To complete this look, we use the pull-up. The pull-up allows you to really focus in on growing the lats, which are those wing-like muscles that are on the edges of your back. Over time, as we contract these muscles of the lats more and more, they're gonna grow wider and wider as we place more demand on those muscles to grow and become stronger. Squeeze, 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 squeeze. You know, perfect. The golden V taper is the ratio of the width of your shoulders to your hips. And the more discrepancy we can make between those two, the better your physique is gonna jump off the screen. So when we started, Scarlett hit about three repetitions on the pull-up. By the time we finished filming Ghost in the Shell, Scarlett could do eight pull-ups. In the climax, her scene was phenomenal where her arms ripped off. Scarlett's physique was so impressive that director Rupert Sanders decided to put a scene in where her back was showcased just because she looked so incredible. Olivia Cook, Ready Player One. I had six weeks to prepare Olivia for her role as Artemis in Steven Spielberg's Ready Player One without any real clear knowledge on what stunts that she would have to perform. From the book, I learned that basically it was an over-the-top treasure hunt based in virtual reality where the possibilities were endless. Our programming kind of had to represent that. It was how much could we throw at Olivia and how much athleticism could we develop over the course of the next six weeks that ultimately would help her in any stunt that she needed to do during the course of filming. When I first assessed Olivia and when we first met, I could tell right off the bat that she was super invested, high energy, and just really down to do anything. So we kind of hit the ground running because we had such a short amount of time. The big thing that we tried to incorporate was a lot of movement flow, a lot of jump training, a lot of absorbing impacts because that's where the movie lied. Women are more vulnerable to ankle sprains and ACL tears. So that's definitely something that we want to always remember in the beginning stages of our programming. Because the hips are wider, their knees tend to buckle in a little bit more. When you're in a fight scene, you may get pushed into a, a weird, awkward angle and land incorrectly and, and blow out that ankle or hurt the knee. We had her jump out to a one o'clock position, and when she landed, we would use the terminology of pretend that you're landing on a plane of glass and you don't want to break the glass. That is the way to safely ensure that she's absorbing impact correctly into her glute, into her knee, down into her ankle, and that she's coming back. After a soft landing, she would then return back to her left foot at the center of the clock, and then repeating the same thing at a three o'clock position and then a five o'clock position. Because we're so used to walking just in forward, uh, forward plane of motion, jumping out to the side in this safe, controlled manner really will be helpful later on as these stunts progress. I wanted Olivia to learn how to land softly by absorbing the impact of the jump into her hip and into her glute and with a strong knee that wasn't collapsing in. And by doing so, you're taking any like unnecessary strain off the ankle. A good metric that we had for Olivia's progress was something that I'll say is subway legs. 
So after our first couple sessions, she would come back and, and joke around and laugh about how she would have to hold on to the railing walking down the subway stairs. And then by the end of the six weeks, subway legs were no longer a thing and Olivia was running up and down the stairs after a crushing 75 minute workout with ease. Sean William Scott, Goon 2, the last of the enforcers. I learned the difference between a moment and a career is evolution. Sean's character was a hockey enforcer, also known as a goon. That player's responsibility is to protect the star player by beating up the other team. At the end of the first movie, Sean's character, Doug, blows out his right shoulder in the final scene. So for the sequel, we had to teach Sean how to be a Southpaw fighter. Sean and I had six weeks to prepare for his role in Goon. Making somebody comfortable fighting on ice with their non-dominant stance in six weeks is nearly impossible. Imagine writing a letter or eating with a fork with your non-dominant side and then multiply that by 10. A good power punch requires coordination of the entire body, not just the arm. That means you need to learn how to radiate tension off the floor, through your ankle, through your hip, through your core, and then ultimately dial all that tension through your shoulder and then into your wrist. Throwing a medicine ball with your non-dominant side is much like a punch in that you have to turn over your hip, but it's a much simpler movement to learn. So there's two versions to the medicine ball side toss, one being more representative of a uppercut, which we throw from the hip, and the other being more representative of a power punch or a cross, which we throw up near the chin. After the medicine ball, we had him progress to the jammer press. And here, you can really see that it represents a punch in the way that you need to turn your ankle into your hip, into your core, and then ultimately through your shoulder. When we first began to throw punches, it looked very choppy and unpieced together. There was a slight hesitation before each throw that you could see that the brain is trying to figure it out. But towards the end, there was really no difference between his left or right side when it came to how we were fighting. Ben Platt, the politician. Before I got the call to work with Ben, he had just finished up working on D.R. Evan Hansen, which he actually won a Tony for. In this Broadway show, Ben's character was a socially anxious teenager. Spending so much time playing this character on Broadway really started to have effects on Ben's posture in the real world. So his shoulders started to round forward, um, his back started to round as well, and it made him look insecure. He came to me wanting to prep for this new role in The Politician. In The Politician, Ben plays a very outgoing, confident teenager who's running for his class presidency. I will fight for each and every one of you, so long as there is strength in me to fight. So give me your vote. My goals for Ben Platt were to, number one, fix that posture to really exude that confidence that he would have to play in the politician. And number two was to make sure that Ben looked his absolute best for the opening scene of the show where Ben is in the shower shirtless. Ben and I worked together five to six days per week. The workouts were 60 to 75 minutes in length. Instead of just jumping right into weight training for Ben, we really decided to attack his mobility and to regain movement through his upper back. And we did that through thoracic mobility drills. You're gonna drive your elbow down and really rotate your shoulders. The goal here is to get your left shoulder in line with your right. I had Ben do this thoracic mobility drill to really unlock his spine and to open up his shoulders. The goal here is to get a lot of rotation through this upper back region so that the lower spine could be nice and stable. Within a week, we could already see changes in Ben's posture and after Ben regained his mobility, I added farmer walks into his training. A farmer walk is simply grabbing the two heaviest weights, whether they're kettlebells or dumbbells, and carrying them with good posture as far as possible. The heavy load of that weight causes the shoulders to depress and slide down his back. In that opening scene, he looked phenomenal. 